Kia ora koutou katoa. Where I lived for the first 17 years of my life, there was cemetery. It was a cemetery up the hill. Uh, you could see it from the bus stop. Not particularly well looked after in those days. I never went in there, and I never saw anyone else in there either. Later, when I was a teenager, I learned that a bunch of my relatives were buried there, including my grandmother. We never visited her grave, which struck me as strange. Still does. I didn't get to have that conversation with my parents before they died, or with other folk in the neighbourhood for that matter. Why did we stay away from cemeteries? Certainly there were places to respect, and of vandalising a gravestone then and now is an offence to all cultures in our land. But did the dead really want us to stay away? Much later in my mid-thirties, we lived in Epsom, next to a graveyard where I, as the minister, had some responsibilities. This was a very different graveyard from that one on a Birkenhead hill. People came into this graveyard all the time. There were lots of flowers. Children's laughter could often be heard. The graveyard was, and probably still is, a place of community. When we read back about the early Jesus movements, there were two contradictory things we learn about graveyards. Firstly, they were places of defilement. They were the abode of spirits to be avoided in the darkness. Not dissimilar in a way to the traditional Māori understanding of urapā, with a need for a washing rite when you transition from the sacred to the ordinary, from the tapu to the noah. And secondly, the other thing we learn about graveyards, like in the Roman catacombs, is that a number of Jesus groups gathered in cemeteries to not only mourn and remember, but to celebrate their connections with the dead and with one another, and to eat and drink in that gathering. It was as if they were not frightened of the spirits or frightened of the darkness. Being together, they made hope alive in this seemingly hopeless place. Just as the healing of the possessed man happened in the graveyard. This is our story from the Gospel of Luke. It's also Mark and Matthew. There are a few helpful things to know about this story. It's called sometimes the Gerasene Demoniac. And the first thing to know is a location, Gerasa. It was about 60 kilometers southeast of Lake Galilee and was where Roman soldiers had killed a thousand young Jewish men, plundered and burnt the villages. Was the mental illness, the possession of this man, due to the violence he, or his family, or his friends, had suffered? And the location of Gerasa makes for a very long run for those pigs to the sea. Well, the sea being the Lake Galilee. 60 kilometres. But trauma and loss are more important to the story than any fact-checking about pigs and lakes. Secondly, language. The name of the demons is said to pos- that possess this ill man was said to be legion. Well, legion only had one meaning back then. A division of four to six thousand Roman soldiers. So he's calling the demons Roman soldiers. 
Similarly, the term used for herd, not really appropriate for pigs who don't travel in herds, was a term that was used to refer to military recruits. In the phrases, Jesus gave them permission, <coughs> implies a military command. And the word for pigs, rushing into the lake, suggests troops rushing into the battle. And of course, the enemy soldiers being consumed by water also brings to mind the demise of Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. And lastly, linking. There was a deliberate linking of things considered impure by those who belonged to Israel. Pigs, demons, Roman soldiers. And the linkage is not just impurity. These three were also good at consuming. Pigs eat pretty much anything, in quantity. As the immortal Miss Piggy once said, Never eat anything you can't lift. <laughs> Sorry, I like Miss Piggy. And secondly, demons. And let's call demons the personification of psychological dislocation. A psychological dislocation, both individuals and communities. So these demons possessed, ate at, the heart of this mentally ill man. And his community. See, the Romans, the colonizing overlords, also consumed. They possessed, dispossessed people of their land. They disempowered people. And they, including dislocating them from their community, raising villages, people shift, big people movements going on. The Romans ate at the heart, the self esteem, and belief of the people in order to control and to subjugate. And in our story, the consumption is total. Mentally, physically, spiritually, this possessed individual and his community were in chains. So this is not a simple healing Jesus story, you know, like healing someone who's blind or healing someone with leprosy. And see, this is a symbolic story about being consumed, about being colonized, not only in your land, but in your mind and heart. The man is symbolically both a prisoner and externally and internally fettered. It's a story about trauma and loss for the individual and community at Garassa. And for all who experienced the brutality of Roman occupation. In the telling and retelling of the story, the hearers would visit and acknowledge their own suffering at the hands of the Romans. And the hearers would also laugh. There's a very deliberate insult joke included here. The Romans are pigs! Ha 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 ha! This legion of Romans go and inhabit the body of pigs, swine to swine. But the story is encoded enough so that it's not heard as a throw the Romans into the sea insurrectionist tale. So laugh, but not too loudly. Laugh, don't take up weapons. It's going to come to a bad end for you. Being together, remembering trauma and loss, making a joke at the oppressor's expense, having the pain healed, at least for a while, by the counter spirit of the crucified Saviour. Such things generate hope. And some in the Jesus movement use such a storytelling strategy to engender hope. The Jesus movements in those first centuries had three things in common. Firstly, the all-pervasive violence of the empire, writ large and following the anointed Jesus, who a man who was himself tortured and died a horrid Roman death. His spirit of fearlessness, courage and honour 
It's the stories created around them said, lived on. And lived on in them and in their communities. Their healer, if you like, their saviour was a man whose body was broken by Rome. Suffering shaped their self-understanding. And the responses to the suffering, the strategies to cope, were widely different between Jesus' groups. Some told stories like this one. Others told stories filled with joy and beauty in order to forget the violence for a while. Others created fantasy fiction. Think of the book of Revelations. To encode their anger at Rome and their desire for its demise. The wicked Babylon. Well, the wicked Babylon was actually Rome. It's on seven hills. And then there were others like Paul who who took that language of brutality, the crucifixion, and refashioned it as a language of honour. Remember that bit from Galatians? I am crucified, yet I live. The anointed lives in me. Secondly, the Jesus movement had an overwhelming need for places of refuge. Places in which they were safe and could care for one another. These are much more important than any beliefs. Most Jesus' movements didn't fit within the normal, socially sanctioned institutions of society. Like households, for example, with a paterfamilias, a patriarch in charge. So they repurposed, they experimented, reimagined households where the gender distinctions were minimised or the roles reversed. Where the normative hierarchical structure of class was flattened and even lapooned. Some groups, for example, call themselves the enslaved of God, taking again that word of denigration, slave, and making it a badge of honour. The biggest experiment was the representation of safety itself. Usually safety was associated with fathers, generals, kings, emperors, and their gods. But the Jesus movements turned all that health and safety stuff upside down. With their image of a crucified, read, loser, saviour, whose Jewish god was also a loser. Never won any battles. The Romans, you thrash him all the time. He was a weak god. And the third and last thing they had in common, these Jesus movements, was the practice of eating together. This was their most characteristic trait. It only started to die out after the advent of the third century's Constantinian Christianity. Jesus' followers ate together, feasted together, toasted each other, toasted Jesus, talked, argued and wept together. And from this community building grew a set of participant behaviours and morals, ensuring respect, honour and reciprocity. And they were considered mad. Just as Jesus was considered mad. Read Mark 3.21. This was no simple survival strategy of keeping your head down till the storm of empire passed. No, they made communities that practiced a reversal of society's conventions. Conventions about who was in charge, who was to be honoured, and who was to be considered ill or mad. And while hovering on the edge of provoking the empire's wrath, they created an alternative, upside-down empire that lampooned the existing one. So the challenge for Jesus' communities now, like us, is not to replicate what our forebears did. Their context was very different. The violence was different from here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The insecurity was different. The pyramidal patriarchy was different. 
But of course, violence, insecurity and patriarchy are still alive and well, just in different forms. And their resources back then were very different from our, our resources are in Aotearoa today. Yet the challenge is still how to make community, how to make safe spaces for body, mind, heart, refuges for all those marginalized by the mainstream and its conventions, all those who think differently, act a little differently, you and me. The challenge is how to find time and space to do what really matters, that breathes life into us, puts a smile on the dial. Things like eating together, dreaming together, experimenting with those dreams together. And the challenge is how to face the big myths and assumptions of our culture, our global culture. Assumptions like having, owning and getting ahead, which are all motivated largely by the desire for security. These big myths and assumptions can possess us, consume us, dislocate us, make us mentally ill. Instead, we need to find together the freedom and security in a counterculture a counter-spirituality of giving and losing, caring and celebrating. Have a great week.